We come this evening in our consideration of this great epistle to the, Roman, to the Romans to the 25th verse of the third chapter. The third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans, verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now you will remember that I've been indicating that it seems to me that in this verse we come to the beginning of a, a new subsection of this uh, great section that uh, runs from the 21st verse of this chapter uh, to the end of the chapter. I have suggested that in <laughs> verses 21 to 24 the apostle is uh, just stating to us the way of salvation but that from verse 25 on he deals with uh, some of the great characteristics of this salvation. Now, there is a, a sense in which this uh, division which I'm making is uh, not an absolute one. The two parts are obviously very closely connected. Uh, for here at once you notice that the apostle is going on with a statement that he's already started uh, in the 24th verse. There he told us that we are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth. So that uh, while this is, I think from the ultimate standpoint, the beginning of a new uh, subsection, nevertheless it is vital for us to realize that the connection with the previous one is a very close and a very intimate one. In other words, the apostle now begins to describe to us this uh, redemption which he has already told us the gospel announces and declares in Christ Jesus. He uh, begins to uh, explain to us how we are redeemed in this way by the Lord Jesus Christ and furthermore why it had to happen in this particular way. Now we've got to keep our eye carefully on both those things. He not only explains how it's done but why it was done in this particular manner and indeed why it had to be done in this particular manner. Now, once more I would remind you that we are looking here at one of the most important uh, verses in the whole of the Scripture. There is no question about that at all. Somebody has described this as the Acropolis uh, of, of the Bible and of the Christian faith. The whole section that we are dealing with from verse 21 to verse 31 in this chapter is absolutely crucial for a true understanding of the Christian doctrine and way of salvation. We therefore cannot examine it too closely and too carefully. Now, because it is so important, of course, it is a passage, and this verse in particular is one which has led to a great deal of disputation, a great deal of arguing there has possibly been more discussion and debate and argument in the Christian church throughout her long story concerning the way of salvation and especially concerning the death of our Lord and the atonement than concerning any other single subject. And that shouldn't surprise us. As it is the crucial and the key and the central doctrine, it's not a bit surprising that the enemy, the devil, should have done his utmost to confuse people with respect to it, and uh, that therefore there should have been all this discussion and debating instead of worshipping and adoration. Now, it would be very easy to 
take not only this evening's session, but many another session, in just giving you an historical account of the ways in which people have argued and debated about this and what they have said concerning it. Let me just give you one illustration to show you what I mean. The uh, translations will show you uh, this very point which I'm trying to make. Take, for instance, the, Re the American Revised Standard Version, which has been so popular in these last few years. Now, that translates it like this. Whom God hath put forward as an expiation by his blood. You notice, no longer propitiation, but expiation. Now, there is just uh, one of these uh, tendencies uh, to which I am referring and to which I will refer in greater detail in a moment. You see, there is a translation that has already become exposition. Uh, it isn't translation any longer. It's become exposition. It's put one word which doesn't mean the same as the other in the place of the other. And that is something which... Uh, I could illustrate it to you, as I say, by many other examples. So that obviously, as we come to look at this great verse, we've got to be very careful, and we've got to be unusually wary. Very well, then, what is the statement? Well, the first thing is fairly clear. It is this. Whom God, he says, hath set forth. Now, the actual word uh, which is translated set forth, can carry the meaning of uh, just uh, proposed or what is translated in the first chapter of this epistle, purposed. The apostle uh, says, you remember in that first chapter, in verse 13, now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. It's the same word. But that isn't the only meaning to this word. And there is very little doubt but that these Translators of the authorized version have been quite right when they have translated it as set forth. Because the whole context more or less demands that. You notice in verse 21 the apostle says, but now there's something new. Well, what is it? Well, it's this. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Set forth again, you see. Made plain, revealed, manifested. That's his emphasis here. And indeed, uh, again later, he more or less says the same thing in verse 26, the following verse, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. Something's being declared. So I think this translation is right, and we take it as, whom God hath set forth, publicly set forth. Now that's the apostle's way of describing the cross the death of our Lord on Calvary's hill. God was there setting forth in public. He was making a public declaration, a public exposition. He was publishing something. Now, it's a very interesting idea, this, because you do recall that in writing to the Galatians, the apostle again uses <laughs> this same idea with another very interesting word. In the third chapter, he puts this, at the beginning, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth. Now the real meaning of that word is placarded. I placarded him, says the apostle. And that is the way he describes his preaching. That he was a setting forth in public, placarding the death of Christ upon the cross. And what he says here is that God has done that in public by what happened on the cross on Calvary's hill. But now then, here's the vital question. What was it exactly that did happen on Calvary's hill? What is the meaning of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross? Now, there is an answer to that in this great verse, and that's why it's such an important verse. And the answer is given in two words which are absolutely crucial. The first is the word propitiation, and the second is the word blood. Propitiation, blood. 
Now then, let's look at them together. Take this word propitiation. You have it here. You notice that we had it in the first epistle of John, second chapter, second verse. You have also got it in the first epistle of John, fourth chapter, tenth verse. There, there are the New Testament usage of this word propitiation at any rate in the authorized translation. But the word which the apostle used and which is translated propitiation here is not the same word which is used by John in the two examples which I've just given you out of his first epistle. It's the same root word. It belongs to the same family, but it isn't the identical word. And that has introduced a certain amount of difficulty with regard to this verse that we are looking at this evening. The word which Paul used and which is here translated propitiation is exactly the same word which you will find in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5 where I read this. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat. Let me read you those few verses. The, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 9, you remember, is describing the old tabernacle of worship. He says there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing or overshadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now then, the word translated propitiation here is the exact word that was used there by that author and which is rightly translated as the mercy seat. It is also the same Greek word which the translators of the Old Testament, you remember the Septuagint, the translation of the Seventy, which had taken place about a century and a half before the birth of our Lord, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek. It's known as the Septuagint, the translation of the Seventy. They, in the same way, when they came to translate this word, mercy seat, used this very word that Paul used here, but which is translated as propitiation. Now then, there are those, therefore, who say, that it should have been translated as mercy seat here. What would that tell us? Well, you remember the importance of the mercy seat. There it was in the holiest of all, the innermost sanctum of the tabernacle, separated by this veil from the holy place, which was in turn separated from the outer courts and so on. Now, this is the significant thing. Only one man was allowed to go into that holiest of all, and that once a year only, and that was the high priest. The high priest used to go into that holiest of all on the great day of atonement, and he used to take blood that had been obtained from the sacrifice of animals, and he would take that blood in and sprinkle it on this mercy seat and before it. What was the object? Well, that was the way of making atonement for the sins of the people. He went in bearing the sins of the nation and bearing this blood. The animal had been sacrificed. He is taking the blood of the sacrificed animal and offering it thus to God. And he sprinkles it and God accepts it and he goes out and the people know that their sins have been atoned and have been covered again for another year. Now then, there are those who argue that that is what the apostle is saying here that he is saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is the mercy seat appointed by God where he meets men and tells him that he has pardoned him and forgiven him. You remember that this mercy seat was a slab of gold, as it were, on top of this box, the ark which contained 
uh, the golden pot with the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now the top of this box, this ark, was this sheet of gold, and it ended on the sides of the cherubim, the cherubim representing God. And the two cherubim were looking down upon the mercy seat. You see, under this mercy seat is the law, God's law to men, which men has got to keep. There it is, the mercy seat with the law underneath, and God, as it were, looking down upon it. And when the high priest came in and sprinkled the blood, God announced that he was satisfied that the law had been honored and that the people were forgiven. There are many who have therefore said that that is exactly what is being taught here, that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's new mercy seat where he meets all of us who believe in Christ and says to us in this way that the law has been honored, that our sins are forgiven, Jesus Christ as the mercy seat. Now, there are many who have thought that and who still think that. But it seems to me that we really must agree once more with these authorized translators and with the vast majority of commentators uh, throughout the centuries, the vast majority of evangelical commentators throughout the centuries, who have said that it is better to, to translate it as propitiation or as propitiatory sacrifice. Why? Well, for this reason. It would be a very odd thing for the apostle suddenly to introduce a technical term like this without giving any explanation at all, he doesn't make use of any of the Levitical ceremonial in this epistle. And it would be an odd thing for him suddenly to introduce it without saying anything at all about it or explaining it, just throwing it, as, as it were, at, at these Romans. So there is very little doubt, but that the real meaning is better conveyed by this idea of propitiation or of propitiatory sacrifice. Of course, in the end, it comes to very much the same thing. The propitiatory sacrifice, the blood of the propitiatory sacrifice is sprinkled on the place of propitiation, which is the mercy seat. So in the end, of course, it comes to exactly the same thing. But there is no single place in the whole of Scripture where the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the mercy seat. There are many in which he is referred to as the propitiation or as the atonement and so on, but not a single instance of where he is described as the mercy seat. And it seems to me, therefore, that that is sufficient grounds for us uh, to accept this translation and to call it means of propitiation or propitiatory sacrifice. Very well. What does propitiation mean? What is to propitiate? Well, it means to appease, to placate, to avert anger or wrath. Now, the great uh, Puritan divine Dr. John Owen has said that there are four things which are essential elements in any propitiation, and here they are. A propitiation implies four things. First, an offense to be taken away. Secondly, a person offended who needs to be pacified. Thirdly, an offending person, a person guilty of the offense. And fourthly, a sacrifice or some other means of making atonement for the offense. Now, those four points are really very important and have been generally accepted. The whole notion of propitiation implies those four things. An offense which needs to be taken away, a person who has been offended and who needs to be pacified, the person who, who has offended the other, and a sacrifice or a means of atoning for this offense which this offender has committed against the one whom he has offended. Very well, then, what the Apostle is here teaching is this. That what our Lord did by his death upon the cross 
was to appease God's wrath. This is a statement to the effect that God's wrath has been appeased, that God has been placated as the result of the work which our Lord did there by dying upon the cross. Now then, I have given you a positive exposition. But I must go on to say that this is an exposition which is hotly disputed today and has been for some time. Now somebody may say, well, why do you bother to deal with that? Why not be content with just giving us a positive exposition? Why do you trouble now to tell us about uh, the people who disagree with this? Well, I'll tell you why I do so. And why I feel compelled to do so. I've already told you that there are certain translations which reject the exposition I've just given you. I've referred to the American Revised Standard Version. I find all sorts of evangelical people using it and imagining that it's all right because it's easier to read. They think it must be better. But you see, a translation is sometimes interpretation. And when you realize that there wasn't a single evangelical translator on the board that translated that particular translation, well, you must expect things like this. The mere fact that a translation seems to read easily doesn't mean of necessity that it's a good or a true translation. A man's prejudices may come in, his interpretation may come in, and it's come in there. Well, very well, we've got to deal with it for that reason. Because a man may say that means expiation, not propitiation. Not only that, I have got further evidence. I was reading in a well-known evangelical periodical about three weeks ago, I think or a month ago, a review of books for reading during Lent. And there I saw a book praised very much. The reviewer said that he warmly recommended this for devotional reading. I must confess I was surprised because I knew something about the standpoint of the author of the book. It was a book on the cross. I was surprised. The next step was that I saw a review of the same book in a, a paper that is not only not evangel evangelical, but uh, opposes evangelical doctrine and is frankly and avowedly liberal in its theology. That praised it equally. And then, uh, almost by accident, the book came into my hands, and I read it. And I found that that book, which had been warmly re recommended by the evangelical periodical, not only does not believe in a propitiation, but attacks the notion. And indeed, attacks the generally accepted evangelical view of our Lord's work upon the cross in his death. So I'm sorry, I feel constrained to deal with this matter in detail. Uh, people, unfortunately, still tend to believe anything they read in a paper or in a, book or in a journal. And if they see anything in a supposedly evangelical journal, they say, this must be all right. Well, God forbid, I say, that anybody should buy that book and read it and think that that is evangelical doctrine. It's a denial of it, which the reviewer, for some remarkable reason, did not seem to have recognized. And then, still more interesting in a way, I discovered only this last week an article on this very subject in another paper which is not evangelical. Listen to this. To propitiate is usually taken to mean placating or pacifying an angry person, doing something to appease someone who has been offended. A great many people have supposed that this sort of reasoning can be applied to our relationship with God. He is offended by our sins and something must be done to avert his anger. And since men cannot accomplish it, it is said... And since, men, and since men cannot accomplish this on his own, Christ, it is said, has appeased God's wrath against sin through his death on the cross. It is in this sense that many understand the texts whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, Romans 3.25, and he is the propitiation of our sins, 1 John 2.2. 2. And the author goes on to say, I cannot think that this is a satisfactory explanation of what those texts mean. And he goes on uh, to suggest that uh, it is almost blasphemous to do this. Now then, 
We are living in times when it isn't enough for us just to accept an interpretation that is put before us. We must know why we accept it. We must be able to defend it. We must be able to comprehend it and to grasp it. And therefore, I will put this position to you. On what grounds is it that people reject this term propitiation and want to substitute for it that other word expiation? The man in the article I've just been quoting from, he does that very thing. He says we ought to get rid of this word propitiation and put in place of it expiation. Now then, why do they say that? Well, these are the two main reasons. They say, first of all, that they've got uh, reasons from language, philological reasons, linguistic reasons. This is what they say. They say that the word granted as used by non-biblical biblical and pagan authors certainly did carry always that suggestion of placating and appeasing an angry deity. But, they say, when you come to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it no longer carries that meaning. And as the Apostle Paul generally quotes that Septuagint version, it's obvious that he likewise didn't mean it to have that particular connotation. That's their first reason. Their second reason is this, and this is the more important one that this whole idea of the wrath of God is not only wrong and must be utterly rejected, that it is almost blasphemous. Now they don't hesitate to say that. They say that it turns God into some sort of monster or of ogre, that it's a totally unworthy idea. They said that's the sort of Jews' conception of God in the Old Testament. I was reading a sermon by a popular preacher today not so long ago. He said he didn't believe in that God who sat on the top of Mount Sinai, issuing forth his wrath and his anger. He believed in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The whole notion of wrath in God they regard as utterly abhorrent. They say this is so foolish. They say, what is wrath? What does the Bible mean when it talks about wrath? Well, they say wrath is nothing but an inevitable effect of human sin. If I put my finger in a fire, I get pain and I burn my finger. Well, now they say wrath is something like that. The moment a man does something that he shouldn't do against God, he suffers for it. Not that there's any wrath in God. Wrath is the inevitable consequence of wrongdoing. If a man does wrong, he's going to suffer for it. It's inevitable. It's automatic. It's got nothing to do with God. It's just in the nature of doing that which is evil. So you see, they say, that for men to be reconciled to God did not necessitate that anything should be done on God's side. They say God is love. God is always forgiving and always ready to forgive. God has already forgiven. The trouble is that men in sin doesn't know that he's blind to it. Sin blinds him. All that is necessary is that men's eyes need be open to God's love. You needn't do anything to God as it were. There is nothing necessary on the Godward side. Now that is their position. So, you see, they say that all that is necessary is what is called expiation. What is that? Well, expiation just means that the guilt of the sin needs to be removed. Expiation is just the process in which you cancel the guilt of sin and purify the sinner from it. And so, in their translations and in their commentaries, they turn this word propitiation into expiation. Whom God hath set forth as an expiation. They say, you mustn't use that other word. That suggests that God is angry against sin and against the sinner. And that there is some element of appeasement involved. But they say that's, that's an insult to God. It's almost blasphemy. It's expiation. The sin must be blotted out from the sinner. And then all is well. Now then, this is obviously a matter which we've got to face. And what is our answer to this position? Well, we can meet them on both the charges and on both counts. 
First of all, from the standpoint of philology, there is scholarship, so called, on the side of propitiation, quite as powerful and quite as numerous as on the other side. You see, there is always this danger of following some expert on language. It's been the curse of the last hundred years. Men are fixed on particular words. They've tracked it through classical Greek literature and they've tried to establish a new meaning. They've ignored the context. They've ignored the whole tenor of the biblical teaching and have turned everything on an odd meaning or shade of meaning of a word. But I say that purely in terms of linguistics, this argument that propitiation should be turned into expiation can be completely answered. Now, for the sake of some who may be present who are interested in these things, let me put it to you like this. The great exponent or proponent of the theory that you should do away with propitiation and call it expiation is the well-known biblical scholar Dr. C.H. Dobb, who is certainly a great expert on the Greek language and so on. But I say there are others who are utterly opposed. The late Dr. Moffat, who wasn't an evangelical, he was violently opposed to this and stood for propitiation. But if you want a really up-to-date book answering the position of Professor C.H. Dodd, well, you will find it. It's a book known as The Apostolic Preaching of the Cross, published by the Tyndale Press by a man called Leon Morris. Now, let me make it clear. This isn't a popular book. It's what is called a scholarly book, a 15-shilling book. But if there's anybody who would like to go into the arguments and see Dr. C.H. Dodd's arguments taken point by point and answered on their own level, well, there is the evidence for you. And there you will be referred to many other books and to many other writers. So that don't let anybody browbeat you by saying, oh, but Greek scholarship has now proved that it isn't uh, propitiation, it's expiation. Just reply quite quietly and say that is not the case. The Greek scholars, as is almost invariably the case with them, are almost exactly divided. It is very rare indeed that the philologist settles any question. There are as many on one side as there are on the other. So you can't get rid of it like that. But now then, come to the second matter, which is much more important. The wrath of God. Now, I try to deal with that when we were dealing with the 18th verse of the first chapter. I went into it very thoroughly. Let me briefly remind you of what I said on that occasion. Here is an idea, a notion that is to be found everywhere in the Bible. Listen to this. In the Old Testament alone, more than 20 different words are used to describe the wrath of God. And these various words in various forms are used 580 times in the Old Testament alone. Now, you see, these men don't believe in the wrath of God. They say it should be banished. But in the Old Testament, this idea is put before us 580 times. You've got it in the New Testament. I gave you the evidence. Our Lord himself talks about it, about the wrath of God. It's in the Gospel according to St. John, the supposed Gospel of love, repeatedly. The wrath of God abideth on him. Our Lord brings it out in the whole parable of Dives and Lazarus. It's everywhere. He speaks about the place in which their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He's the one who spoke those three parables recorded in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. It's in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the whole world in righteousness, says the Apostle Paul. Peter preaches it on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. It's everywhere. In this epistle to the Romans, this doctrine of the wrath of God is mentioned ten times in this one epistle. The idea of the wrath of God is put before us ten times, and certainly in the book of Revelation, you are confronted by it from the very beginning to the very end. The wrath of the Lamb. And how every eye shall see him, yea, and they that pierced him. 
the, the wrath of the Lamb. In other words, if you go through your Bible without theories and preconceived notions, you will see at once that this notion is so prominent that God is angry about sin, that God hates sin, that the wrath of God is upon sin. Now, we must be very careful as we define this. The writer of this article, which I've just quoted to you, rather makes fun of the evangelical position by saying that we are picturing God as some angry, wrathful potentate. But of course, we are doing nothing of the sort. The word wrath tends to convey that impression to us. It tends to convey the idea of passion, uncontrolled passion. But you never get that in the scriptures. The scriptures do not uh, depict God by the word wrath uh, as someone who is unreliable and capricious and who is always bursting forth into a rage. That idea is not here at all. And it's not essential to the idea of wrath. What does the wrath of God mean? It means this. It means his settled opposition to all that is evil arising out of his very nature. It is because God is light and in him is no darkness at all that he is in settled opposition to everything that is evil. His nature is such that he abhors evil. He hates evil. His holiness of necessity leads to that. Then in addition to that, it seems to me that this other idea seems to regard sin as if it were a sort of substance and forgets that sin is something that is always attached to persons. The problem is this, the personal relationship between God and men. Sin is not a something, it's not a substance. It is a condition of a human being. It is the condition of a soul. You can't separate sin from persons. So when God deals with sin, he has to deal with persons. And when he deals with persons, he has to deal with sin. So the Bible teaches everywhere that God is opposed to sin and to the sinner. And this personal aspect and personal relationship must never be forgotten. The Bible's view of sin is this, that sin is that which separates between us and God. Sin is that which comes between man and God. God, we are told, is not weary, his arm is not shortened, nor his ear deaf, that he cannot hear, but this sin has come between us. Sin breaks this personal relationship, and we must always think of it in those terms. But not only that, I think I can show you quite easily that these other authors are utterly inconsistent with themselves. I've put it to you, Dr. C.H. Dodd, already, who says that wrath is just the inevitable consequence of sin. Well, then, to be logical, he ought to say that mercy is just the inevitable consequence of goodness. He says you mustn't say that wrath is in God. No, no, wrath is just the inevitable consequence of sin. Well, very well, then, what is mercy? Why not say that if I am good, that automatically mercy comes? He says, no, but you mustn't say that. He says mercy is something inherent in the character of God. On the one side, he puts it in the character of God. On the other side, he takes it out of the character of God. But that's to be inconsistent. Surely the two things are in the character of God. But indeed, he is guilty of another contradiction. Take this whole idea of expiation. Now, these critics say that we must hold on to this notion of expiation. Men sin, they say, must be cancelled. And what Christ did is just to cancel man's sin. But wait a minute. Why does man's sin need to be cancelled? Why do you need expiation? What would be the position if no expiation were made? If there were no expiation made, would it make any difference to God's attitude towards the sinner? You see, the very idea of expiation in and of itself leads to propitiation. If there must be expiation, why must there be expiation? There's only one answer. That there cannot be a true relationship between God and men until that sin has been expiated. 
Well, you see, that's just another way of saying propitiation. There cannot be this true relationship between God and men while the sin is there. That's precisely what the biblical doctrine of the wrath of God says. So that in the last analysis, after all their writing and all their talking, they seem to come back to precisely the same thing. And did you notice how the Apostle John puts it? If any man sin, he says not only have we got a propitiation, which they call expiation, John says more, we have an advocate with the Father. Ah, why do I need an advocate? What's the business of an advocate? Isn't it something in connection with this personal relationship between God and men? John does not merely say that we need a propitiation. We have an advocate also. And that immediately suggests that there is something wrong in the personal relationship. I hope you don't feel that I've been wasting your time. This other idea is so common, it's so popular, and people feel, well, what's it matter whether you say expiation or propitiation? My dear friend, it matters like this, that if you really want to see what God's love is, you must hold on to this notion of propitiation. It's a much bigger thing, a profounder thing altogether. And here, of course, it is the whole argument of the apostle. Haven't I been reminding you for several sun Friday nights past? That from Romans 1, 18, right up until here, the apostle has been dealing with one thing only. The wrath of God has been revealed upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. On the Jew and on the Gentile, none are free. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All are under sin. All are under the wrath of God. That's the whole point. And he says, now I've got a marvelous good news. But now, well, what is this? And here he tells us, a propitiation has been provided. Something has happened and has taken place. And God's anger and wrath have been appeased. Well, now then, how has it been done? Now, here once more, these critics try to ridicule our position by saying this. They say, what you are teaching, of course, is that pagan notion. What the pagans believed was this. They'd done something wrong, and they said, the gods are against us. What can we do? Ah, oh, well, they said, we'll take an offering. We'll take a present to the god. And if we take this present, we'll bribe him, and we'll please him. He'll be so delighted with our offering and with our present that he'll overlook our sin, and he'll forgive us. And they say, you are saying that. What you are saying, they argue, is this, that, that it is possible for a man somehow to influence God and to change God's mind. You're talking about doing something that's going to change God's attitude. But, of course, we are teaching nothing of the kind and nothing of the sort. This has got nothing to do with pagan mythology. This is in no sense borrowed from there, and I can easily show you why. We are not even teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ has changed the mind of God. Let me be honest, let me be frank. There have been certain zealous evangelical teachers who've said that. They should never have said it. There have been certain hymns that have said that. They should never have said it. This is not a teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ by dying has persuaded God to forgive us. Don't you notice what Paul says? Whom God hath set forth. It's God the Father himself who's doing it. It isn't we or even the Lord Jesus Christ who are changing the mind or the attitude of God towards the sinner. It is God himself providing the propitiation in his own Son and by his blood. It is God contriving a way whereby his own wrath upon sin has its full vent and yet the sinner is saved. That is what the Apostle teaches here. And that is the point I'm afraid at which we've got to leave it for this evening. Now are you clear as to the difference between expiation and propitiation? Propitiation carries this notion that there is someone who has been offended, someone who has done the offending. There is an offense. And something is necessary on both sides. Something has got to be done 
from the side of the one who has been offended, as well as from the side of the one who is offending. And this great and glorious doctrine teaches us that the very God whom we've offended has himself provided the way whereby the offense has been dealt with. His anger, his wrath against sin and the sinner has been satisfied, appeased. And he therefore can now thus reconcile men unto himself. So you see the importance of holding on to this great word propitiation. As we go on next week, God willing, we shall see it still more clearly. We shall see why we have to fight for this and to hold on to this. The word blood will reinforce all my arguments. They go together. But I do trust that I'm making it plain and clear. It isn't that we or the Lord Jesus Christ persuade God to do this. It's God himself who's done it. And he has done it in this most amazing and most marvelous manner. If you take out of the Bible this idea of the wrath of God, well, there's only one thing to say. You haven't got a Bible left. Why have people done this kind of thing? I can tell you quite simply. Why do they object to this teaching about the wrath of God? There is only one answer. It is that they have substituted Greek philosophy for the biblical revelation. The Greek philosophers didn't like this idea of wrath. They regarded the whole notion of wrath as something weak and discreditable. They said it was an unworthy emotion, and therefore to attribute it to God was simply terrible. They said that wrath even in a man is a terrible thing. But God, well, the God of the Greek philosopher is impassive. He doesn't feel anything at all. He cannot be affected by anything that happens. He's incapable, of, therefore, of feeling wrath against sin or against the sinner. And all this argument of the last hundred years and all this writing is simply due to that. They said these people, these Hebrews, had got a wrong idea of God. And we must get rid of it. God is love. And nothing but love. So there's no wrath in God and there's no need of propitiation. Some of them even go so far as to say that there is even no need for expiation. And that all the death of our Lord upon the cross does is this. That looking at him dying there, I say, if God even forgives that, well, I must believe it. He's already done it, but I was too dull and too sinful to see it. But there I see it, and my heart is broken, and I accept it. So you see the importance of accepting the authority of the Scripture. If you start with your philosophical idea of God instead of the biblical idea of God, well, then you can throw out wrath, you can throw out anger, you can throw out propitiation, you can throw out atonement, you can throw out anything you like, but it is no longer the Bible, it's no longer the Christian faith. You no longer believe in the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And as I hope to show you next week, you will dislike the whole notion of blood and of sacrifice. So, I trust if we remember nothing else tonight, we will go away with this great idea that we are all forced to this choice. I either submit to this and accept its revelation of God in his being and his character, or else I say, well, now I think. And that's philosophy. And that has been the curse. And the church of God is as she is tonight. Because since about 1840, men have been putting philosophy in the place of revelation. Their ideas before what God himself has so graciously been pleased to reveal. And it affects everything. But it affects above everything else our view of the most glorious event of all history. The death of the Son of God upon the cross on Calvary's hill. Let us pray.
O oh Lord our God, we thank thee again and more than ever that thou hast given us thy word, this wondrous revelation. O oh, keep us ever, we pray thee, to this simplicity that is in Christ. Deliver us, O oh God, from leaning to our own understanding, from any desire to be wise in this world and according to the wisdom of this world. O oh God, keep us ever as being ready to be fools for Christ's sake, that we may thus come to a knowledge of the truth and ever live to the glory of thy grace and of thy holy name. Deliver us, O God, from the spirit of the age and keep us ever subservient to thy blessed Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank thee for this glorious truth that thou hast set forth thine only Son, thy dearly beloved Son, as a propitiation in his blood, thy faith for our justification. O oh, we pray thee, enable us to understand it more and more, that we may rejoice in it as we ought, and praise and love thee with the whole of our being. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.